The fedora wearing John Hudson is taking us down a road as we look at the legendary Jacques Vallée and his UFO research tonight. John, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks, everyone, for sticking around. Dave, how's your voice feeling, buddy? It's it's feeling better. It's feeling better. Uh, Good. You I, sound better. Yeah, I still think, like, I'm not 100%, but I, I think I'm about 85%, 80 to 85%. I think that's Good. a fair assessment. And uh, we'll test it out in the morning when I go for hockey practice with my boy, and that's okay. Hockey. Are you one of those parents that yells all the time at the hockey? Uh... Okay. <laughs> no, no. I coached way too much minor hockey. Oh, that's right. To, that's right. To learn that I hate hockey parents, and I never <laughs> want to be that hockey parent. Good for you, Dave. Good for you, Dave. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. I mean, uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, I never know how many people actually follow uh, Jacques Vallée's work, and um, if by any chance you don't. I, I highly recommend you do so. Um, he's a, a very interesting, very well studied, um, very intelligent man that, that has um, has really dedicated his life to this study in many ways. Um, though he has done some other interesting things, which is funny because living in the Bay Area, that's actually what I originally knew him for. And um, not that I know him personally, but I knew of him. And uh, basically, I'm sure many of you have have heard that he recently came out with a new book. Um, uh, about the, the Trinity event. And uh, I myself haven't had a chance to read it yet, but um, as he's been doing the, the uh, you know, tour around different interview stations and so forth, uh, we started to get some of the real juicy parts out of the books and out of what he's working on right now. And I was really kind of blown away of what was being covered. So let me just hit a couple of the high ones. And I, I, I think even you might be impressed, Dave. So sure. the first one is um, at this Trinity crash, which, by the way, was in, in August of uh, 1945. So this is two years before Roswell. Uh, this UFO went down on this 80,000 acre farm and the military were not the first responders. Two kids were the first responders. And they saw things like they actually went into the craft because from their point of view, it was a downed aircraft that had pilots that needed help. So that was their motivation for actually entering the craft originally. Needless to say, when they found no humans and they found some other things, they panicked a bit. As However, yeah, yeah, as you'd expect. Now, this is a this is a great story. I highly recommend people get into it because it's got some really funny parts to it, like the fact that the army said they needed permission to enter his property because there was a downed weather balloon, and he turned around and came back with a handful of weather balloons and said, "I've been collecting them. Here you are," because he's got an eighty thousand acre plot and he was getting weather balloons all the time. And they're like, "Um, no, actually, it's a it's a fairly specific weather balloon we're after." that needs an 18 wheel truck to get off the property. And, um, but the cool thing is, is that basically um, the last day, I believe it was about a two week operation, the last day when the vehicle was actually on the truck getting ready to go out, the army personnel kept taking breaks. They'd go to lunch, they'd go to dinner, they'd go home at night, right? So one of the boys snuck back into the craft and actually broke a piece off the craft oh, wow. and took it as a souvenir and kept it and he's given it to Jacques Vallée. So this is not a piece of slag that fell off the ship. This is an actual interior part to the ship. Now, I will caveat that with there there is debate going on between Jacques Vallée and his counterparts in that he is now of the belief that the part that the kid recovered might not have been part of the original ship. It might have been something that the army mounted in the ship to hold up electrical cables and lighting. However, there's other people on this team that counter no, this is not something that the army would have used because of the nature of the metal that's used on it. So this is the debate going on, but either way, it's proof that the army was there inside a craft, you know, using electricity to analyze stuff, or it's an actual piece off a craft. One or the other, either way, a whole part, right? Super cool news. One of the boys is still alive. He's in his 80s. Uh, Jacques Vallée was able to interview him. And um, it's just, it's turning out to be a fantastic story. And I, 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 had you ever heard that a whole part had been captured, Dave? 
No, you know, I'll be honest with you, John. Up until I heard about this book coming out, I was very, very uh, naive to this story and ignorant to this story. I, I didn't know much about it at all. I'd heard people talking about it as they do it, like whether it's Pascal Guler or Travis Walton or whatever it may be, but I was very unfamiliar with this. So do me a favor, take a, a minute, 90 seconds to explain the Trinity um Sure, yeah. sure, sure. And but let me just say real quick, don't feel bad. They kept it secret on purpose. Jacques and um uh uh pa Paula Paula oh, Harris. Paula Harris, they they tried to keep the lid on it because they wanted to finish their research before everyone, you know, bared down on them. But basically what it came down to is a ship uh came out of the sky and essentially crashed uh onto this farmer's land who had eighty thousand acres right near White Sands took out a communication tower as it came in, landed intact with occupants, was not that badly damaged. Uh, the two boys uh, did go into it. Um, things that they noted was that it had a flat floor, which Jacques Vallée then determined based on the measurements that he got of the ship, that there was about two and a half feet of depth beneath the floor of the ship that might have housed its its propulsion propulsion systems but there was no sign of any propulsion systems whatsoever uh they have no idea what happened to the occupants it was not only this part that they got they also got several other parts and the father was recovering parts from that site for a long time many of the parts ended up getting used in the farm <laughs> they actually used the parts to do things like repair windmills and so forth um, what's interesting is, is that, um, the, it took two weeks to remove it. They brought in an 18 wheeled truck to remove it. There was significant equipment needed to remove it. So this was not a light object, nor was it a small object. And, um, but the army was very open with him. They asked for permission to enter the land. They were very friendly with the family. It wasn't like this big cloak and dagger thing. Cause it's in 45. No one's got experience with this. Right. And the ship was gone in two weeks. The occupants disappeared in one day. They don't know what happened to them. And um, essentially life life went on. And uh, these two brothers kept this story. Uh, um, one of them passed away. One of them still alive. And, and, and she found them. And this is just a beautiful diamond in the rough story two years before Roswell. Wow. That is amazing. It is. That is it amazing. Is. How come this story hasn't really up until now taken off like Roswell did or other uh, stories have. What, what's well, your opinion on that? Well, essentially because until the book came out, which was honestly only about four months ago, um, there was an active suppression going on of the story. And essentially um, she, she's the one that brought valet into it. Valet found out about it from 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 Paula. So I mean, she kept it. She she got this story. I don't know. I don't know exactly how she got her hands on it, but she she sunk her teeth into it, and it became her pet project. And essentially, um, it was intentionally kept out. Now the book came out four months ago. It's now been translated into several languages. Um, they believe that there there might be a connection to Roswell, and that some of the material recovered is very similar to the material that was rumored to be recovered at Roswell. Um, and so it's possible that it was a similar vessel. Um, but essentially it comes down to the fact that they kept the lid on it until the book came out. And now finally, and my understanding is, is that like when the book first came out, some of the early reviews I read of the book didn't give me a reason. I, I didn't feel compelled to read it. I kind of put it on the, put, I, it's on my list, but I hadn't read it yet. There wasn't like a, Ooh, I want to read it. And it's only because, uh, Jacques Vallée has been doing all these interviews that I've suddenly been like, whoa, like this is some, there's a bunch of stuff going on that I wasn't aware of. Um, Cause the other thing he, he talks about is that um, there's a professor at, at Stanford, a, a doctor, um, a Dr. Norman? Peter. No, no, this is, no, this is Dr. Uh, this is Dr. Peter Surak. And Dr. Surak is an interesting individual because he's a professor, professor emeritus, which basically means that he's been there a long time and they can't touch him. And um, and he had done some material analysis in the past, but unfortunately, he had only had a very small amount of that crash site. Well, Jacques Vallée, being Jacques Vallée, went down to Venezuela and started asking around and found a UFO museum that had more of it. 
And so he actually, they gave it to him. He grabbed it. He brought it back to Stanford and gave it to this guy. And so this, this Dr. Uh, Derek Sorok is basically working with Valet to analyze this material. Once again, using the same isotopic uh, analysis ability that we've heard about from from Gary Nolan because this device is a one million dollar device and my understanding is there aren't many of them in the world and um, but the really really exciting part other than the coolness that Jacques Vallée was able to just go down and go hey I, I'd like more of that and they gave it to him um, you know it must be nice being Jacques Vallée and um, uh, hopefully Carrie here he cares around a copy of that movie and says like you know this is me right um, but um, the really cool part is that um, this professor, uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Sork and, and Valet have been working for two years on a paper based on the isotopic ratio analysis of the Venezuelan parts. I don't know if it include if this paper includes the Trinity parts or it's just the Venezuelan parts, but I, it's it's material. And they've made it through peer review. The paper has now been accepted for publication. Wow. It won't actually be published for a couple months. I, I cannot put enough emphasis on what I just said. Their paper has been accepted for publication. That means they've passed peer review and it's going out in a respectable and in a, in a very official way to a very wide audience of scientists. And it's gone through two years of peer review. This, for, for, for a lot of people like me, this is what we've been waiting for. Do we know what publication it's going to be in? No, he did not say. Um, and and, he, and he's, he's trying to be a little more careful. He, you know, he's, he's only saying so much because until it actually gets published, um, you know, uh, it happened to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dean Radin once where he got a paper published and uh, a week later they pulled it down. <laughs> Because some of the some of the people giving money to that group basically complained and, and had the paper pulled after publication, um, and so so you you do want to be careful. And but I guarantee you, uh, uh, I mean, Dr. Peter Stark, I, I haven't met him. Um, I'm, I'm I'm going to try to um, as soon as I can. But because um, Stanford's very close to me, and I I went there for three years a couple of years ago in 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 the theoretical theoretical physics program that Peter Sark works in. So I'm, I'm hoping I might be able to finagle a meeting with him. And, um, and so, um, so, but I guarantee you this guy in valet, they're being careful. They are being, they're dotting every I crossing every T they, they, and honestly, no one would let them survive peer review unless they had done so. I guarantee you that peer review is brutal, just brutal. But he says, one of the things that, about this paper is he focuses very much on the process they took as well as what they discovered. Because one of the big deals about doing this kind of research is, is you're analyzing things you've never analyzed before. There's no, there's no, there's no compare, like there's no, uh, there's, there's no standard set. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's very, this is a, this is the beginning of a, of hopefully a, a a nice process that's going to continue rolling out as more and more people get feel confident enough to to start publishing papers and man this this is i don't know how significant this individual paper is going to be but just the fact that they're getting it out is huge absolutely huge why do we continue to look towards jacques valet as the leading researcher. I mean, I realize the man is brilliant. I realize the man has been around forever in this field. And, you know, he's probably the top scientist in the world working on this that we are public about. You know what I'm saying? But why, after all this time with, with everything that is go on, going on, why are we putting so much stock into him? I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of this that came out on his interview with uh, George Knapp the other, the other night. And that was that, you know, as many of you know, Jacques Vallée for a long time now has been saying that he doesn't think it's it's physical aliens from another place. Right. He thinks it's something else. He thinks it's something something else. Right. He doesn't think it's 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 actual ships coming here from afar. And this was his stance for this has been his stance for a long time. Right. And, a, a, you know, a lot of us have entertained the, the, you know, that hypothesis. And what he said with George Knapp is, is he's he he's had to eat a little humble pie with this one. And, and th those were his words. 
And, and basically, so for, for him at, at his age, with his credibility, with his stature, with, with his history to be, you know, so willing now to just follow the data, just but for Christ, just follow the bloody data, stop pre-thinking the stuff and just follow the data. And that's what he did. And now he's completely changing. He he still doesn't know if it's from another dimension or if it's from a distance or he's not he hasn't leapt any of those conclusions yet. But he has now had to accept that there is a very physical hard element to this phenomenon. And and that's changed his stance. And for him to make that flip like that, that's that's those are the kind of people we want. Well, I mean, I can understand where he would get his fill of the woo because Paola Harris is filled with woo. All right. Yeah, but boy, does she get credit for this one, man. That like this is this is this is good, you know, bits and bolts and and I mean this is this is this is good stuff. This is really this is something you can take into a lab. It's gonna be interesting to see what the highlights are that that are coming out of it. It's going to be very interesting to see. I have one final question for you. We only got about yep. 45 seconds. Yeah. We're starting to see Lou Elizondo get a little frustrated with some of the questions he's being asked on interviews. Now, obviously, when you do as many interviews as him, you know, you're going to get a lot of the repetitive questions, but he's really seeming to start taking shots back and dropping the gloves a little bit with anybody who is questioning whether or not he worked at ATIP. What, what's going on there? Most of us cannot lower our armor for just one thing. We lower our armor as a unit. And what this means is that as he becomes more comfortable to share, as he becomes more relaxed to share, like in that interview with Kurt, he shared some really cool information that I thought was super interesting. It was very personal. The, the instant he lowers his guard enough to share that, the guard against showing his emotions for his frustration go down with it. And so it's just, it's just, it's just part of being human. It's interesting to watch him change. It is. It's fun. It's actually really fun. It's I'm really enjoying as, it. Not as robotic anymore. John, we'll see you for the after show. And uh, here we go with Shirky Poo's news.